So you may have heard of this little song, Rich Men North of Richmond, a sort of folksy, twangy, right-wing, blue-collar, government bad, taxes bad, being five foot three bad type song. Basically, everyone who is going to talk about the song already has. Music review channels like Anthony Fantano and Punk Rock NBA, left-wing political commentators such as Vosh, The Cabernacle, Hassan, The Majority Report, and right-wing political commentators like Ben Shapipo, Map Walsh, Dim Tool, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Despite the overwhelming attention the song is getting, I've decided to throw my hat in the ring as well, because I would like to talk about the fans of this song. Left-wing commentators have primarily been arguing that this song is astroturfed, that big players with deep pockets on the right have thrown a lot of support behind this song, and so its popularity is illegitimate. There may or may not be some truth to that, but the folks who threw their support behind this song could have just as easily thrown their weight behind a song that was just three minutes of someone saying tax is bad over and over again. Tax is bad, tax is bad, tax is bad. And sure, big right-wing commentators promoting such a song would get it in front of a lot of people, but it wouldn't retain an audience or blow up virally off of recommendations alone. Basically, pretending rich men north of Richmond doesn't have genuine fans is pretty misguided. I first heard this song on TikTok, and I thought, Oh cool, some political folk singer I haven't heard yet, let's give it a listen. But I was turned off by the anti-welfare stuff, so I scrolled on and forgot about it. That was until everyone was talking about it. Map Walsh saying it was a breath of authenticity in a fake world, Hassan saying it was hypocritical and misguided, so I decided to give the song another listen. And afterwards, I instantly thought of my father. That's right, mister, I'm dragging you into this. Now, I don't think my dad would have been a fan of this song. He didn't much care for country, he was much more into thrash metal, industrial metal, butt rock, and things like that. Mostly apolitical stuff, although sometimes songs would flirt with populist right-wing libertarianism, such as Peace Cells by Megadeth, Trees by Rush, Don't Tread on Me by Metallica, and stuff like that. Growing up, my father was very much in the George Carlin, South Park, cynical, everyone's dumb but me camp of politics. Not fond of Clinton, but not a fan of Bush either. My father always worked manual labor, working in paper mills and semi-truck construction and repair and things like that, living the very life that rich men north of Richmond is trying to speak to. My father remained an above-it-all a political cynic until the Obama-Trump years. Much like the 2015 documentary The Brainwashing of My Dad, my father was working around fellow conservative-leaning political skeptics and listening to a lot of talk radio on his commute, and started following a lot of right-wing social media stuff and jumped on the anti-Obama train, sharing memes and talking points about how he was an illegal immigrant Muslim communist gun grabber. At the end of his life, my father was a full-on pro-Trumper, having a signed framed photo of the president hung in the living room as well as getting me this awesome collector's Trump coin as a gift. Perhaps you can picture the kind of guy my father was. Maybe you've got a coworker or friend or family member, or hell, maybe yourself, in the same boat. Although he might not have been a fan of this song, my father most certainly would have posted it on social media, if not texted it to me directly. I think the song's success has a lot to do with the vague wide appeal of its messaging and with the public's lack of class consciousness and media literacy, allowing people to enjoy the song while misunderstanding or overlooking some of its more contentious elements. I'll explain what I mean in a little bit, but first, let's actually look at the song itself so that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. The song starts, I've been selling my soul, working all day. Overtime hours for bullshit pay So I could sit out here and waste my life away Drag back home and drown my troubles away So these first few lines are about being overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. Something that resonates strongly with people. And it makes sense. Probably 99% of America can totally relate to this message. Actually, didn't we have a massive protest about that a while back? Nah, eh, that's another story. What I will say about this is that it's interesting that folks are rediscovering this type of song now when political singer-songwriters have never stopped writing songs about this stuff. Anyways, the next couple lines are just vague pronouncements. It's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me and people like you. I wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is. Okay, sure. The world has problems and I wish it didn't. Whether or not I agree with that statement depends on what problems we're talking about, and more importantly, what solutions are we talking about? Let's continue. Living in a new world with an old soul, these rich men north of Richmond, Lord only knows they all want to have total control, want to know what you think, 
want to know what you do, and they don't think you know, but I know that you do, because your dollar ain't shit, and it's taxed to no end, because of rich men, not rich men. Okay, so here's the conservative angle, and specifically why mainstream conservative commentators are supporting this song. Complaining about the rich men north of Richmond, aka the federal government in Washington, D.C. Talking about how they want total control of our lives, and we want the government off our backs, aka less taxes, less regulations. Making a very vague argument about how we all know it's a total scam. In fact, I think that this is hitting listeners so strongly because he's appealing to us as listeners directly. Hey buddy, you and I both know that there's a problem with the government, gesturing vaguely. But again, he's not wrong. Most Americans, again, probably 99%, would agree that the government is corrupt, that it's self-interested, and that we are overtaxed compared to the goods and services we receive from the government in exchange. But if he's so correct, why are leftists critiquing this message? Why are conservatives loving it? It's because this focus on the federal government is pulling attention away from the owners of the land, the owners of the workplaces, and the economic system of capitalism. It's what Marx called false consciousness something that pretends to speak to the workers, but is in fact misleading them. I think the left-right divide on this can be best described by comparing two quotes. Ronald Reagan saying, The government is not the solution to our problems, the government is the problem. Taking attention away from the capitalist owners and blaming everything on the government. Let's contrast this with John Dewey saying, Politics is the shadow cast on society by big business. The attenuation of the shadow will not change the substance putting the blame on big business, where it actually belongs, in my opinion. Anyway, let's get to the next lines of the song. I wish politicians would look out for miners, and not just miners on an island somewhere. Lord, we got folks in the street ain't got nothing to eat, and the obese milk and welfare. Okay, people seem to really like this line, the Epstein's pedophile island reference, but it's complicated. With the conservative arguments earlier in the song, it's hard not to hear QAnon dog whistles, But again, he's not wrong, just misdirected. Like, do politicians engage in sex trafficking and sexual abuse of minors? Yeah, sometimes they do. But it wasn't just politicians on Epstein's fly list. Just look at Trump and Epstein's affidavit from 2016. When it comes to the rich and powerful abusing children, it's not just the government and politicians. It's tech bros, hedge fund managers, CEOs, and even doctors and lawyers engaging in this stuff within the U.S. or traveling to some third world country to engage in sex trafficking and sexual abuse of minors there. The lyrics could have just as easily said something like, I wish the billionaires cared for the poor folks work in their land instead of flying off to abuse minors in Thailand or something like that. But that's just half of the line. The other half is talking about folks living on the street who don't got nothing to eat. Okay, so are we getting some decent class analysis here? Nope, because then he immediately pivots to complaining about supposed fat people milking welfare. Okay, cool. And he elaborates on this point, saying, Well, God, if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not pay for your bags of fudge rounds. Young men put themselves six feet in the ground, because all this damn country does is keep kicking them down. Now, the singer claims that this is actually a complaint about junk food killing us and not supposed to be a dig on obese people living in poverty in food deserts or whatever, but let's think critically here. This literally follows the line, the obese milk and welfare. It's obviously easier to read this line as complaining that us hard-working moneymakers are paying taxes to buy junk food for lazy fatsos, a classic conservative argument which demonstrates a complete lack of understanding of the issue, and yet another reason why right-wing commentators love this song. Anyways, he finishes the song by going back to the chorus. Lord, it's a damn shame what the world's gotten to For people like me, people like you I wish I could just wake up and it not be true But it is, oh it is Living in a new world With an old soul Rich men north of Richmond The Lord only knows They want to have total control Want to know what you think Want to know what you do And they don't think you know But I know that you do Cause your dollar ain't shit And it sacks no end Cause a rich man North rich man I've been selling my soul Working all day For overtime hours For bullshit pay
This is just a reaffirmation of the conservative messaging. The government's the problem. The government wants total control of our lives. The government is literally 1,984. Taxes are bad. We want the government off our backs, less welfare. It's funny because Virginia, where Richmond is, is actually a net drain on the federal government, getting back like $1.47 for every dollar they pay in taxes. But, um, okay. So how is this song being received? Well, I have now watched a bunch and I mean a bunch of reactions and reviews to this Rich Men North of Richmond song. Lord knows they all just want to have total control, want to know what you think, want to know what you do. And this is the rise of the surveillance state, immediately images of the lockdowns and censorship. This is where the song really sings. This is where the song really takes off. When he's saying, when you're five foot two and you're 300 pounds, then welfare shouldn't be paying for your box of fudge rounds. I wish politicians would look out for minors and not just minors on an island somewhere. <laughs> no, it reminds me of off the cuff, uh, Zach Califiancus from uh, the, uh, the oh. Hangover movie. He's looking at the fact that he has to adapt to a system that he's not even designed for. Mm -hmm. Well, God, for five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not pay for your bag of fudge rounds. Fair enough. Guys, I found an artist unlike any alive today. He's the real deal. And Ainsley, you'll love this. He opened the show reading scripture before we played songs. Number one song on the Billboard chart is called Rich Men, North of Richmond. So let's talk about why it resonates with people. Well, first and foremost, the song is a bop. Competent playing, passionate singing, it's catchy as hell. It's obvious that all of this helps its appeal. But let's talk about the song's substance. A lot of populist blather about the federal government being corrupt, taxes being lame, and working overtime hours for bullshit pay. The problem comes with understanding what those generic platitudes mean and what solutions are being proposed to address those problems. I think this is a failure in understanding class consciousness on the part of Oliver Anthony, the creator of the song, as well as the fans of the song. This misunderstanding is exacerbated by the urban-rural divide and the tendency of the middle class to be reactionary. You see, when this song and the conservatives who support it talk about the federal government being corrupt, taxes being lame, and working overtime hours for bullshit pay, their solutions are A, wishing that they could wake up and it not be so, B, lower taxes and cut welfare, and C, no more fudge rounds. All solutions which don't address those problems. Us on the left on the other paw, when we talk about the federal government being corrupt and taxes being lame and working overtime hours for bullshit pay, our solutions are A, giving workers more power in their workplaces through co-ops, unions, workplace democracy, and the like. B, better social services so that a worker doesn't have to choose between overtime hours for bullshit pay and getting evicted, but instead can come to an employer with greater demands because they have options if those demands aren't met. And C, changing how the federal government operates. Redistricting, liquid democracy, proportional representation, ranked choice voting, and things like that. Basically, all things that will absolutely address the federal government being corrupt, taxes being lame, and working overtime hours for bullshit pay. So why might I, a left-wing, urban, working-class individual, have such totally different solutions to these problems than a right-wing, rural, working-class individual? Well, despite both being working-class and exploited by the wage system under capitalism, the rural conservative might work a manual labor job with little interactions with the public. He probably does not see much homelessness. He might have a giant pickup truck to commute to work with. He might be making payments on a house or some acreage in the countryside. And perhaps he makes decent money for where he lives. So he's primarily upset about property taxes and other taxes and the cost of gas. I, on the other paw, am part of the urban working class. I've worked primarily service industry jobs working with the public. I have an expensive apartment which I rent but don't own. I walk to work. I don't make very much money compared to other folks living in this city. I don't pay property taxes or anything like that. And because I'm in an urban area, there's a lot of food banks and needle exchanges and homeless folks, which comes with living in a densely populated urban area. So I would actually like to see taxes raised and used to fund social services to address those problems. This urban-rural working-class divide is nothing new. Marx and Engels were writing about it like a hundred years ago. For example, in the German ideology, they wrote, The greatest division of material and mental labor is the separation of town and country. The town already is, in actual fact, the concentration of the population, of the instruments of production, of capital, of pleasures, of needs, while the country demonstrates just the opposite fact, isolation and separation. 
a subjection which makes one man into a restricted town animal, the other into a restricted country animal, and daily creates a new the conflict between their interests. So if we want to be serious, politically-minded folks, when we talk about this Rich Men North of Richmond song, we have to think about how false consciousness specifically impacts us along the urban-rural working-class divide via our material conditions impacting our stances on taxes and social services. But that addresses the rural-urban divide issue for why people are supporting and or misunderstanding the arguments of this song. What about the second thing, the reactionary tendencies of the middle class? Well, you see, another aspect of false consciousness is that folks can be tricked into fighting those around them for what little they can rather than organizing and working together. The most obvious example being each employee at a workplace fighting each other for better pay, creating a system with few winners and many losers, rather than organizing together into, say, a union, for example, and fighting together to secure better pay for everyone. When it comes to conservative working class folks, particularly rural ones, this plays itself out when they want to pull up the ladder behind them. Now that they have stuff, a decent job, a house, a truck, or whatever, and they don't want to help the working class folks below them. They want less taxes on their property, cheaper gas for their long commutes, rather than collectively fighting for taxes to go to social services to benefit those around them, or fighting for more environmentally friendly mass transit or something like that. Basically, fighting for better welfare rather than attacking those on welfare. So often in our history, unhappy, misguided people have created scapegoats, blaming those that are different for the problems in their own lives. But this rural-urban divide and the tendency towards reactionary positions is only exacerbating a wider issue. The truth is, folks are basically politically and economically dum-dums, flooded with cognitive biases. Many folks know that they're getting screwed over, but they lack comprehensive understanding of the systems around them. So rather than thinking systemically or with a sociological imagination or with class consciousness, they just look at what's going on around them and make inferences based off that. Let's look back at my father, for example. When he thought of rich jerks looking down on him, he wasn't thinking about capitalists. He probably never met one. Who did he meet, though? Professional managerial class folks. Tax collectors, doctors, lawyers, managers, and things like that. He was probably much more likely to have a negative view of the boss above him at the shop than the capitalist owner of the entire company. And just like he had false consciousness around those economically above him, so too with those below. He would often complain about having to work all day, often multiple jobs, while illegal immigrants and lazy bums were living the high life on welfare. This is a cognitive bias called the actor-observer bias that we tend to judge others for something we find wrong with them while making excuses for our own similar behaviors and shortcomings. I've been on food stamps and welfare. Anybody help me out? No. And this Rich Men North of Richmond song is tainted by this sentiment, hilariously striking in the line, We got folks in the street ain't got nothing to eat, and the obese milk and welfare. As someone who lives in a city around a lot of homelessness, it's ironic because it's often the homeless folks without the ability to store or prepare healthy foods with no refrigerator or stove or whatever, who are living off of unhealthy prepared foods, which leads to obesity and other health problems. It's like, my guy, the folks on the street with nothing to eat and the obese person on welfare, they're often one and the same struggling working class person. This is just blatant hypocrisy and blanket misunderstanding of the issue. Oliver Anthony, writer of the song, fan of the show, you claim to be a centrist who is critical of both the right and the left, and some of your other songs and your little vlog videos on YouTube somewhat demonstrate this. And in that way, you seem to be in the same place my father was in the early 2000s. So you might want to take a hard look at yourself and ask, why is it that so many right-wing commentators love the message in this song? Why are so many left-wing commentators critical of it? I think the reason is due to the song's limited political and sociological perspectives, cognitive biases and all that. And we're all guilty of that, mind you, but those things can cause us to find dangerous and unhelpful solutions to our problems. Something I hope that I've explained well here. And, um, Ollie, do you mind if I call you Ollie? Ollie, w while I have you here, it was cool that you said diversity is our strength in that recent interview, and your messaging in that recent song, I Want to Go Home, it's better. Still kind of reactionary messaging with the I want to go back to the good old days type stuff, but it is better than this other song. 
I'm hoping that your career doesn't look like that meme where the centrist joins the right. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, I'll finish this video with a question that's been going around lately. What is the left's response to this? As someone who has listened to and performed folk punk for like 20 years now, I find this question very silly. Looking at the replies to this question on Twitter, many folks are mentioning artists like T-Swift, U2, Lizzo, or whatever, since there's plenty of mainstream musicians promoting liberal political positions. Yeah, sure, but I don't think that really answers the question. I wouldn't say that this mainstream stuff scratches that itch of a working class, classic Americana folksy song. So then, some folks bring up Utah Phillips, Woody Guthrie, Anne Freeney, Pete Seeger, and things like that. And yeah, sure, that stuff probably fits the intention of this question better than recommending pop music, but that stuff is like literally 500 years old. I think the question, what is the left's response to this, is really trying to say, hey, there's this modern blue collar right wing good old boy working man's folk song, but I thought the left was the side of the working class. What do you have to say about that, socialists? It's like these folks are just discovering something that isn't new. There are so many modern political singer-songwriters out there. Let's talk about the real deal. For country music specifically, there's Lost Dog Street Band, Julie Lavery, Nick Shoulders, Pink Williams, Jake Blount, Evil, Coulter Wall, Sierra Farrell. Just go check out anything from Gems on VHS or some Y'alternative or Cottagecore playlist on Spotify. If we're talking folk music specifically, we could talk about David Rovix, Jeff Tweedy, Ryan Harvey, Billy Bragg, and others. And if we add folk punk into the fray, the list gets very, very long, very fast. <gasps> Matt Pless, Mischief Brew, Ramshackle Glory, She, Her, Hers, Ludlow, Evan Greer, Man Tits, Homeless Gospel Choir, The Haymarket Squares, Average Joey, Apes of the State, Sister Wife Sex Strike, Abusing the World, Evil Robot Us, Against Me, Riley Coyote, Moon Bandits, REO Deathmatch, Johnny Hobo and the Freight Trains, Wax Attachee, Acoustic Front of the Resistance, Cadre, Cody Van, Criminal Culture, David Hughes, Screw You in the Four Chords, The Department of Corrections, Are They Brothers, Mike Muffins, 37 Cents, Tom Pirate, Trail, Nil Dust Brandom, Sunny Ward, the Truck Bed Boys, the Bridge City Sinners, Everyone Except Me, Ash Brickley, Rosa, Fairy Boy, Happy Box, Fire Ant Season, The Window Smashing Job Creators, Turncoat Collective, Interstate Death, Johnny One Lung, All Against Me, Michelangelo Rufino, Opposition, Peace Now, Ryan Williams, Shane McBride, Slugs Revenge, Starla Yumbiquitos, The Gardener, Tim Avery, Tom Comstock, 40 Ounce Freedom Fighters, Dirt Face Daredevils, Fork the System, Gnarly Walls, Coffee Binge, Andrew Jackson Jihad, Tom Frampton, Porch Cat, Chatterbox and the Latter Day Satanists, Robert Blake, I Kill Cameron, Rail Yard Ghosts, We the Heathens, Cousin Boneless, Wingnut Dishwashers Union, Broken Glass, Defiance Ohio, Rent Strike, Michael Jordan, Touchdown Pass, Chi Chi, Pat the Bunny, Dog Tooth and Nail, This Bike is a Pipe Bomb, Freshwater Octopus, Days and Days, Chad Hates George, Stuffy, Dick in the Dirt, Broken Bow, Anus Kings, Betty Betty Blackfoot, Birdie Bird, The Can Kickers, Ghost Mice, Environmental Youth Crunch, Chechno, Blackbird Rom, Human Petting Zoo, Nikoniko y Las Peras, Mika Rasmussen, Overdose on Vitamins, No Cops for Miles, Emasculate Misconception, My Pizza, My World, Deep Inside, A Raccoon Venom, C is for Cadaver, Nate Mays, Narlos, Sharp Knives, Onsen, Benchmarks, Happy Happy, The 4%, Run Rabbit Run, Brief Descent, Parking Lot Bandits, Sage Against the Machine, Trendy Dog with Sunglasses, Bird Among Men, Cats Not Cops, Stack Like Pancakes, Copper Ice Scarab, Dog Years, So Death Cannot Find Me, Littlefoot, Conrad and Freeman, Escape from the Zoo, Bling Go, Trash Bag Ponchos, Dirty Harry, Beans on Toast, Flower and Skunk, Hail Seizures, Anti-War Pigs, Tequila Mockingbird, Asking For It, This Is a Robbery, Heathers, The Devil is Electric, JC and the Pennies, Kyle Hall, The Casual Terrorist, Frank Turner, Stick and Poke, Balkan Beatbox, Saturn BC, Bird Teeth, Walter Middle and his Makeshift Orchestra, Jesse Williams, Mooney Merrill, Chris Kelvin, Pass the Jug, Mutiny, A Sense of Porpoise, The Wild, Shell Shag, The Taxpayers, The Slaughterhouse Chorus, Dollar Signs, American War, Ankle Grease, Annoying Backcountry. And if you want more than that, you can scroll through r slash folk punk or Fistful of Vinyl or Pink Couch Sessions or Punks with a Camera or any number of Facebook groups or Spotify playlists or maybe even look for recommendations in the comments of this video. So many places to find good political working class singer songwriter stuff out there. Um, whew. Anyways, as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your tremendous support has allowed me to get dog insurance, which is wonderful. You've allowed me to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. Gotta love that. You provide me with a little extra funds for books and dog toys and things like that. It's really awesome, and I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical review. Thanks for watching. I've been working all my life, but ain't got nothing to show. I ain't telling you nothing you know already. Know. I've been working all my life, but ain't got nothing to show. Wanna run up in the White House and kick in the door. Bye.
By the way, in that long list of folk punk bands, one of those is my band, and I'm hitting the recording studio in about three hours, so wish me luck. Yay.